Welcome everybody to the Chaos West stage. This is uh, a self-organized session for you people with your ideas which were not able to be presented in the big halls. The first man up on the line is a very good friend, <laughs> Lynx, who was partying a lot last night and that's why we started late. <laughs> um, please have a applause for Lynx. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we're present. We're talking about three and a half ways to enhance metadata protection. I'll, I've added a half in the meantime while doing the slides. And uh, and it's not terri terribly scientific, but it's not terribly low level either. I, I realize there is kind of something in between that people are not totally aware of the possibilities uh, regarding metadata protection. They just use Tor and Tor doesn't always do the job. Uh, why is it even important? Well, um, metadata protection is the only thing that we have that protects a kind of freedom of association on a digital level. And uh, that actually has implications on our ability to exercise democracy. So um, it's not something that a few interested people should be uh, caring about. It should actually be a fundamental function of the internet for the entire society so that democracy uh, remains or comes, becomes useful again. Um, but let's skip all the politics for today. Uh, that is, we'll get back to politics later on other days and uh, talk about the technical details. So uh, both Tor and I2P are, are oriented on low latency applications. I2P a little less actually, not necessarily. But um, especially because we always want to get on some website on the web and trying to access the web is the problem itself. Um, because the web is architected in a way that even if it, it if, if it is providing static data with text that has been lying around for years maybe, it is artificially creating an urgency to be real-time connected to the web server and get all those images and all those inline elements and get all that. And that makes it uh, super ideal for fingerprinting who is looking at something. So if you're uh, accessing the Facebook uh, timeline, dashboard, something, if you're logging into Facebook, the combination of, of pictures and texts that you're going to be presented is probably unique enough to uh, recognize, fingerprint you and recognize you, uh, when you when the data arrives on your web browser. So um, we want to have some options uh, how to address that. And um, one thing that uh, the Tor community occasionally talks about is uh, how can we have a constant bandwidth between the Tor nodes? It's a, it's a terrible because it consumes a lot of bandwidth. And what are we going to do? We're going to throw it all away and, and just consume bandwidth? Because if, if you make a constant transfer to the entry node, if, if you have a constant transfer of data, um, then it gets uh, less uh, easy to uh, de-anonymize you. Um, in fact, it is already possible in the way you use Tor. If you use Tor with uh, always the same entry guard, just one entry node, which is the default anyway, and it has been tested and proven. There's a paper presentation that I didn't mention here. I think it's linked on the on our web page uh, that showed that if you're using Tor for several purposes at the same time, like uh, downloading YouTube uh, streams, uh, videos from YouTube or something, then it is much harder to correlate any, anything you do over Tor and at the same time. So um, it makes sense to design an anonymization system that uh, constantly and intentionally does this kind of protection to have covered traffic by including all the other applications that you use the internet for into the same stack, into the same platform. We should not be having different 
platforms for different purposes, like for file systems, we have IPFS, for uh, um, routing, we have CJDNS, for uh, anonymity, we have Tor, and then we go to Mastodon. What? Why? Uh, so uh, we should actually have something more integrated that gets all the applications into one new uh, stack that helps protect uh, um, the metadata. So uh, streaming, uh, social networking, file sharing, things that should all be integrated so that they protect all the low uh, latency communications. Another thing is making dedicated applications. So um, when you're uh, writing a dedicated application for uh, a, a networking uh, platform, then you can pass entire packets, entire messages in one go, and uh, the network can optimize to send the entire message, and the network can protect you from the, the message getting fingerprinted, uh, like separated into pieces. That's the problem with a POSIX socket uh, interface. If there's a space between the entry or the exit from the anonymization network and the place where uh, the data is, is sent and generated, that is where traffic shaping attacks are possible. And that is exactly what we do all the time when we uh, visit the regular uh, web. We leave a Tor exit node and we go to a web server. And from the web server we get uh, material and it is being sent to us on a best effort uh, delivery along a, t a socket. And the problem is that attackers in between can repackage uh, the, the transmissions in smaller packets and make them, um, f uh, shape them in a way that they are unique. And if this shape can then be recognized at the receiving end where you are, then you are, can be de-anonymized. That is the uh, major uh, weakness in the Tor architecture. Okay, as long as you have the, your Tor router on your own host, uh, on your own computer, that is me pretty hard because they can only shape the packages as they go in and then it gets harder to find where they come out. Should you have any distance to your own Tor router, then it makes you uh, attackable this way. And uh, the strategically better way to go is if, uh, if uh, Tor or if anonymization networks weren't just offering a SOX5 or a POSIX socket kind of interface, but if they allow to do real applications that intentionally send message as a whole, as a whole thing and it cannot be split apart anywhere. So uh, that can be a way to deal with it. That's why, that's why in the GNU-NET stack we tend to uh, rewrite all kinds of applications and make them native GNU-NET applications. Uh, we're from the SecureShare, we're trying to do a social networking uh, um, platform and, and interface and everything on top of GNU-NET. And we intentionally use GNU-NET protocols so they don't, they're not susceptible to shaping. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, good news about this congress is we're going to have two main, main talks on the topic of mix, mixed networks. So, I won't go much into depth about it. I won't even explain what they do because you're going to be to find out. Uh, they have the limitation that they introduce a very high latency. So they make sense for uh, emailing. They might even make sense in a reduced scale for chat and social networking. So we are very happy that we're going to include some mixed network uh, technology into GNU-NET and into SecureShare. But um, it, it, there are many applications where it's not exactly practical. And uh, for some cases, it is extremely useful if the flow of the packets isn't actually always going the same way, like in Tor, it follows a certain onion route, or if you're going straight in the internet, it usually goes straight from A to B. Um, 
uh, it is practical if uh, the same route, uh, if the same uh, connection from A to B is sometimes being sent over different routes because that's the best way to protect against phoneme detection in encrypted audio streams. So if you want your phone call to stay private, it's not enough to encrypt it. And it's not enough to onion root it. it uh, there are papers that have found out how to recognize the language being spoken over an encrypted stream, the person who is speaking, and to recognize uh, and to make guesses at what is being said. So uh, that's not very nice. Uh, so the only long-term uh, solution to protect uh, telephony and conversation, audio, video conversation, is to introduce non-deterministic routing, like uh, casually it happens that GNUnet does that. Or at least we're working in that direction, but yeah, essentially Cadet kind of does that. Uh, it doesn't do it on purpose enough yet, so that's maybe we have to make it more on purpose that, it, uh, that it's unpredictable. Uh, where the packets are going and so an attacker cannot put them back together and apply those phoneme detection algorithms. So we have a, a, actually a choice of tools to protect uh, anonymity, to protect metadata and to protect content and uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, certain goals we can actually sometimes for for reasons of, of practicality leave something out so um, on a mobile phone maybe we don't want to do cover traffic all the time but as long as we're doing framing and uh, onion routing and mix nets that's pretty good or um, in another situation uh, we may may want to do real time telephony so it's not good to do mix nets because it would be very slow it's even maybe not good to do onion routing but uh, it's enough if we do some unpredictable routing if uh, we if the telephony is well framed and if we have some cover traffic uh, on top so with a tool set like that we can uh, configure our uh, situations our devices our applications to use different strategies the way it's best suited and achieve the, the least worst or least the best possible kind of protection in a certain situation. So it is healthy and a good idea to have a, a, a Swiss Army's knife of, of an anonymization technology that is capable of all of that and then your application or even you as a user can choose which one to use. But yeah, of course, for most users, it means it should be automatic. It should be made by, with an intelligent choice, depending on the applications and the situation. And we can automate it, this, and we can make it available for uh, the general public to have a reasonable metadata protection um, in whichever situation they are. So this is the story I wanted to tell. Just one note, um, a summary of this, uh, or actually, I'm <laughs> excellent, <laughs> I love the many clapping here. Um, and a mo more elaborate version of this talk is uh, available on the Secureshare website at the page Anonymity. So I'm essentially repeating things that are written on our website. Okay. Thank you very much for this grand wonderful talk. Um, I will put links on the hot seat for three questions that he will answer. You have the time to come up with your own questions. Uh, just come up here, ask the questions, and at the end, please make sure to tell us where you're seated with your assembly so we can find you and uh, talk to you some more. Are you ready for the hot seat? Yes. The hot seat. The hot stand. Basically, it's a hot stand. So, GNUnet, does it work? Can I install it? Uh, no. <laughs> Are you ready for second to, uh, second question? Uh, you don't want to hear a little more? Do we? Okay, get ready for excuses. <laughs> <laughs> so the excuses, well, we, I feel, um, I don't feel uh, guilty for saying that GNUnet isn't ready to install it because we are from Secureshare and we're the ones spending time fixing GNUnet right now instead of doing coding Secureshare, which is a bit uh, sad. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, GNUnet is an impressive tool set and there's 
always a little thing here or there which isn't exactly perfectly working yet. And we're always so close from, like sometimes we had it working, then something else broke. Um, so um, we're really close at having a, a stack that works, but don't, um, Installation is not exactly super sexy, so don't de don't define uh, by installation because we can easily deliver uh, uh, working uh, versions. Or for the friends of reproducible build, uh, we can have uh, we have reproducible uh, version on on uh, Geeks on uh, Nixos, and we have uh, e-builds for Gen2. So um, don't. Uh, don't be frustrated by the installation procedure. It is complicated and it has reasons for being so. And, um, and regarding the usage, we, uh, we hope that uh, soon uh, we can... Actually, we are not sure if we still have bugs or if it works now. So we have to try it out. That's what we're going to do next is see if, if we um, manage to fix the important bugs and it's actually working now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Then the next question is, um, you fix the internet, is that correct? How do you do it? What's the software development you're using? And how do you interact with the others who help you? That is uh, the subject of uh, another long presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, what GNUnet does is, is provide a whole new internet stack which operates uh, in different ways and a different philosophy. And it's technically more complex than the old internet stack. Okay. And, and it even replaces things like the border gateway protocol because it essentially it, it has a way of finding from A to B by itself over mesh uh, logic uh, using distributed hash tables in a safe and, and, uh, and protected way from civil attacks. So there's a lot of uh, research. It's, it's very scientific. And I think uh, it, it needs that kind of level. Uh, we are no longer in a situation that we can fix the internet by IETF kind of approach, uh, doing something that works like here and now. Uh, we need uh, to uh, learn from uh, what scientists have been working on the last 15 years. What about the programming? Thank you very much. What's the programming language that you use then? Oh, I, I didn't pick it. Uh, at the time uh, when uh, GNUnet started in 2003, uh, they chose C because C was the language that is being run everywhere. And that is also a bit of the, pro the cause of our blues uh, fixing bugs. And I hope uh, that we'll get to a state of maturity that we no longer have to touch the C level code. Uh, there's uh, work going on uh, that we have uh, Rust APIs, we have APIs in other languages. So I hope that all the application level stuff will happen uh, with safer languages than C. That's cool. Um, any questions from all the thousands and thousands of people watching this? Was that his waving? No question. Okay, cool. Any recommendations for us uh, on the Congress before I let you go? What are you doing on the Congress? That's, that's a cool question. Uh, on the assemb and Next Generation Internet NGI assembly page, uh, we uh, made a collection of things that uh, we find interesting. It's not only our own sessions, it's the sessions of friends going, happening elsewhere. And it's a session that are actually kind of on the topic, on spot, interesting. So we made a collection there and, uh, and there's stuff on it. Cool. Then, finally, thank you very much for this awesome talk, Links, and a last applause.